folks, I am Becky with Enduring Finances. Welcome back to our channel. Today we are continuing on talking about Lime and where they are headed as a company. So this is going to be the first part of this because there's quite a bit of information for one video. So we're going to do two. Um, I want to preface this by saying it's really hard to find information on this that's concise and in one location that kind of gives a clear picture. I have been on Facebook groups and different chat rooms and talking specifically with logistic partners that are in place and other people trying to get as much information and the best overall picture that I can to help break it down for everybody that might not have the ability or time to do that. So here we go. We're going to start with what's going on first and then in the second part we'll break in what that looks like as far as a logistics partner and how that all works. But that'll be the second part for this video. I think the big question a lot of people are asking right now is can you still charge Lime scooters without being a logistics partner, so being a traditional user? And the answer is yes in some situations, most situations. So let's get into it. So in regards to Lime users, specifically in California, California is the oddball state right now and I will apologize if you are from California, if you live in California or whatnot. It is the start of what will potentially be a trend for a lot of legislations in other states to follow as far as the California Assembly Bill 5, which is AB5, which tighten the requirements around classifying contract workers compared to regular salary or hourly traditional common law employees that you see at a traditional job. So companies like Uber and Lyft and other driver-based gig companies were very much affected, especially with Lime. To really understand the ramifications of what that bill tightened down, let's establish what the difference is between a contract employee and a regular common law employee. Pretty simple, independent contractors are self-employed workers that run their own business, business entity like a sole proprietorship. So if you just run it yourself and you don't have anything like that, like I do with my stuff, that's where you're at. Or you might have a limited liability company or other different areas that you can go as far as partners and all of that. So they typically have that type of body around them. They cover freelance type work. They're not day-to-day -day task operations for a company. They're usually given a specific task or series of tasks to complete with an independent parent company. And then that freelancer, that independent contractor, has the ability to make the decisions and do the work without supervision from that parent company. So that's a very big distinction on that. There's a whole breakdown of ways that you can look at it, but this is a simplified version. Employees, on the other hand, are supervised by that parent company. They're given set deadlines and rules and all the things on how they are going to accomplish what their tasks are. And the company has the ability to control how they do their job, when they do their job, and essentially what that looks like day to day, hour by hour, minute by minute, in some companies if they micromanage you on how you complete that task as an individual employee inside of that company. So the supervision and the tools and resources that you have are very different. Typically contractors are going to bring their own equipment and they're going to do their own thing and employees are provided the equipment that they need. That's also a, a pretty clear distinction between the two and that's a that's a marginalized aspect of how that works but that's a pretty good clear indicator of what's going on in that regard. So independent contractors have freedom, they bring in their own tools, they work and do it within their own parameters without supervision. Employees are given guidelines and rules and supervised and provided the tools they need within reason to accomplish the task. And that's the big distinction. But when it comes to pay, they're very drastically different. And generally contractors are cheaper for companies to hire and bring in because they're not paid as traditional common law employees. With a contractor, a company simply pays them a set rate for the task they're going to complete and then they call it a day and the contractor deals with all the taxes and insurance and all of that on their back end within their own company or sole proprietorship or whatever in that regard. With employees, the company is required to pay the employer portion of taxes, follow the Fair Labor Standards Act guidelines for labor and the local labor laws and colleagues have the ability to unionize and have a voice heard within a company and kind of have some dialogue with that. Also, employees are entitled to more protections and benefits than contractors are. So here are some of the benefits that a traditional common law employee will see. 
So you have state and federal minimum wage, because some states have it higher than $7.25 an hour. They are guaranteed PTO and sick time per state rules. They have health insurance, depending on the size of the company, retirement plans, retirement matching, depending on the size of the company. They're entitled to workers' compensation if they're injured on the job. Also, disability benefits, um, Family Medical Leave Act, say you have a baby and you take time away or you get you break your leg driving a scooter for fun and you need to take time off to heal from a surgery, that's covered. There's also unemployment insurance if you're fired and you need coverage in that regard. And there's other additional benefits that go on with being companies and we won't get into all of that, but that's the bulk of it. You don't get that being an independent contractor. You are on your own and whatever you earn is whatever you earn and you handle the back end on the back end. When this happened, Overall, these companies were in a very big pickle and they were forced to take extreme action to save a lot of money and to continue operation in California because essentially it came down and it was like, boom, they could not operate in the way that they had been operating for a few years now. So together, the companies, some of the companies that were impacted kind of banded together and spent more than $200 million, and I've heard that's the low end, $200 million promoting Proposition 22 which was a couple of things, but part of that in regards to gig work was the re-examination and reclassification of employees versus independent contractors. So they won in that regard. So Proposition 22 was approved and Lime was not included in that. So Uber and Lyft and some other air, some other similar gig, gig jobs in that regard were granted permission to continue marching how they had been with independent contractors, but Lime did not make the cutoff. And so they had to adhere to that new employee rule for Lime juicers. And that's it's an ongoing thing. I'm sure we'll see some fallout and some changes in other states like Illinois and, and some others are considering moving forward with similar type of rules. So there will be more in the future. We're not in the end to it, but right now Lime essentially had to scramble in order to continue operating in California, which is where they essentially started this company. And they were essentially hitting a brick wall where they needed to hire all of these lime juicers who were independent contractors as employees and give them all the benefits and go through that whole thing. And they did not want to do that. And that's, that's a very big task. There's a lot of hurdles. And so instead of taking on those tasks and jumping through those hurdles, they went ahead and some of some of them worked with juicers that were operating in the areas and asked them to step in as a logistics partner. Others applied for it. There's a back end. There's, you know, there's some, there's some gray area on how everything happened, but essentially they established logistics partners as subcontractors, which falls underneath this classification to fill that gap. And so essentially Lime just buffered themselves from this legal recourse by adding in the local logistics partner who now has to meet all of these state and federal guidelines and Lime doesn't have to deal with it because it's they fall within this, this new specification and the logistics partner now has to find employees in California to do the juicer work that was done as a gig side hustle. So the logistics partners are handling the day-to-day operations of charging and deploying and retrieving the Lime scooters and bikes completely in California. There are no independent contractors specifically through Lime. You might be able to do that through a logistics partner depending on how they have things set up. You cannot do it through Lime anymore. They, the logistics partners are typically operating as a small business. Um, some of them that have stepped into that role have a similar business, like maybe a limousine or another type of ride share commute type business that has similar attributes to juicing. And they have the ability to hire either standard common law employees or they can have independent contractors like the traditional juicers working under them. Depends on the state laws in every area and the country laws because it is international. So I'm gonna do another video that breaks down how to apply to be a, lo a logistics partner, what that looks like, some of the uh, concerns, some of the pros, some of the cons, all of that in a separate video because there's a lot that goes into it. And I wanna finish up with what it means for juicers outside of Lime, I mean, juicers outside of that logistics partner program in this video. What does all of this mean for current and future Lime juicers that are not logistics partners that do not want to be logistic partners. I would say first off, juicers are still playing 
out in the field. They're doing a lot of work in different areas and they're still making good money and there's still opportunity for you to jump into that now and make money as an additional income, part-time job, full-time, depending on the area and what it looks like for you. Um, you can still apply to be in New Juicers in areas outside of California. It's going to depend on how many juicers they already have and if they have a need to bring on more juicers to fulfill that need. Um, I know they've been letting go some juicers that maybe haven't been juicing at all for you know months on end or maybe are on the low end of completing tasks and they'd rather not have them on their books and, and just clean house a little bit. So they are doing that. So if you get an email from Lime saying you have 14 days to finish everything and do that, like they're cutting you and you can try and reapply, but they might not take you. Unfortunately, there's not a set standard or like organizational chart that kind of shows which cities and countries are operating on different models. It's kind of just a free for all what you're hearing from different people. And if you're in that specific area, you know, and that's in that's incredibly frustrating because you don't know, you could apply to be a logistics partner and they might already have six people set up for it and they're not looking for anybody else and you could go through and spend money and do all the paperwork just to get yourself nothing. So it's, it's a little bit frustrating on that end. And so it's a little bit of a hodgepodge situation with Lime right now. I think they're kind of just, I like the term of building the airplane while they're flying it because I, it sounds like it's just chaos and they're just trying to keep things afloat and keep moving forward towards their end goal. So they have different hybrid models of how it's going on. So like California, you have logistic partners only and they have juicers underneath them that are doing the traditional work. You might have some exclusive logistic partners if it's a small area and there's only a couple hundred scooters or so that are the only logistics partner and they might own that spot. Or you might have a bigger city like Seattle where they're outlying for six different logistics partners who will have juicers underneath each one of those. And then we have the additional side where there are some areas where there are logistics partners that have juicers underneath them, but then you have the traditional juicers underneath Lime directly that are also competing with them. And so there's still room for you to sneak in there and get some work done and make some money. I think the big difference we're seeing in those areas is how the taskings are going. Normal juicers don't typically handle any of the bikes or any of the battery swaps. That's gonna be underneath the logistics partners and typically with those Gen 4 scooter models. So if your area doesn't have Gen 4 yet, you might not have logistic partners across the board and you probably have some juicers still working, but you know, every area is different and they're continually evolving with that. If there's a mix of scooters, and they're in that transition or they're, they don't have enough of the Gen 4s to fully equip the city, you might have a mix where the um, logistics partners team is working with those battery swaps and the rest of the normal traditional juicers are retrieving and moving and charging the older scooters. So there's gonna be some back and forth for quite a while because I'm in Boise and we've, been ha we've had the 2.5 generation scooters and I know we just got in a couple hundred of the generation 3 I think and they're pretty beat up and we're not anywhere closer to getting gen 4 so the the possibility that we're going to swap all the way out and get rid of juicers completely is out the window for at least a year is my guess if not a couple of years just depends how everything goes and how much money Lime has to expand and increase that production to the cities that they're already in for cities that are not specifically in California or not completely on the logistics partners program, I would recommend signing up in the area near you as long as they're accepting new users and getting your feet in that market, in that market and establishing yourself. When when the city or if the city transitions to that logistics partners model, you could potentially be asked to step into that logistics partners role or you will have established connections with that area manager or other juicers that might be the new logistics partner that will want you to work for them in the same way that you've been working. So network now and get established and make the money now and see what happens and determine what you want to do as regard to that. If you live in California or some cities like Portland and Washington DC that are pretty open about being all logistics partners, you can go ahead and try and establish your own company with that and apply and get all of the insurance and everything with that. There still might not be an opening for you. 
I would recommend jumping on to the Facebook group because we know that Lyme is not good at sharing information, so there's not one place that you can go to figure out who is a logistic partner, if they're hiring, what their area is, and who else might be a logistic partner in the area. It's very hard to find that information. I would recommend going to the Facebook group Lime Scooter Juicers. It's an international group. People from all over the world post on it, predominantly the United States though, and you might be able to put a message in there say, hey, I'm in this area, I'm looking to do this. Is there a logistics partner that I can talk to? I've seen posts from different logistics partners through various states and countries that are saying they're looking for new workers, um, they're taking applications, they can provide you with some information in more detail, and there also are smaller groups that are on Facebook for specific locations. Um, I can't think of any top of my, off the top of my head. I know Boise has one, and most of the cities probably have one that's private that you can gut in and have some more dialogue before you jump through hoops and start that process. That would be my, my, my starting point for that. If you wanted to do the logistics partner program or you're not able to be a juicer because there already is a logistics partner program established in your area, you can find them potentially through that or you can find someone who knows someone who can put you in contact with that. I think overall Lime is continuing to expand its operations to new cities and to new countries and they are in a race with these other countries and they're in a race with these other companies to essentially stab, establish that stronghold and grab that market share, that new opportunity in all these places before the other company does. So they are focused on expanding as fast as possible to get that market share before their competitors do. So I don't expect them to go anywhere. I think Lime Scooters are a thing that is moving forward. They're very much on the eliminate cars, help the environment, get people from A to B to C, and that is a very big thing right now. So I predict they're going to be here for a very long time and they're just going to continue to expand and increase their presence in the world. I think one of the big things is line moving forward those interchangeable batteries. It changes the atmosphere of how they do their work. Um, I know specifically in Seattle, they have talked about putting charging battery charging stations known as line cubes which are essentially like big blocks where you put the batteries in through, in random parts of the city so that it eliminates the distance that people that are swapping batteries have to go to charge them and replace them which helps speed up the process and eliminates that travel time and work done doing it so they're moving forward slowly to increase that but no matter what, those batteries are still going to have to be charged and swapped out and they're going to break and they're going to need to be serviced. Same with the scooters, same with the bikes. And the way their model is set up right now and the way that it looks in the future, there's still going to be follow-up work in that regard. So I would say if you were considering doing Lime and you were worried about the logistics partner problem, I would go for it and jump into it and see what you can do. You can find used chargers on Facebook in the in the in that Facebook group specifically. They're selling them. You might be able to get some from juicers that are leaving the market for pretty cheap or in that regard. But I would say 100% if this is something that you want to try and create that additional income and help you or your family get through this very hard time where everything is just so expensive. I would do it. Make smart decisions with how and when you pick up the scooters and you will still see a profit margin regardless. So that's going to do it for this video. I'm going to make another video that breaks down the logistics partner side the best that I can with the information that I've gathered, what that kind of looks like, what money might look like for you, and if it's something that you should pursue or if you actually want to work underneath one in the future. So. I will catch you next time guys. Hopefully this helped you see a bigger picture on what's going on with Lyme. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Or if you know anything that I might have missed or misspoke or just didn't understand the right way, please let me know. I'm trying to put out the best information that I can for you all. So I will see you next time guys. Bye bye.